Hi everybody, this is Herb Chase, and we're going to be talking about the clinical reasoning thread. Uh, we're going to visit some of these topics and mechanisms and practice uh, later this week. Clinical reasoning is basically what physicians do. They think about the cases, they think about the diagnosis, they think about the treatment, uh, what tests need to be ordered. These two physicians on the right and this physician on the left, they're separated probably by you know, 200 years, but they're basically doing the same thing. They're sitting and thinking. On the left, uh, that poor doctor probably didn't have much to offer his patient. On the right, uh, maybe those two doctors have too much to offer their patients with all that cognitive load in there. But the point is that that's what we do. We sit around and think deeply about our patients and how best to serve them. Let's look at the clinical encounter and think about the skill set that we all need in order to provide the best care. Patient comes to you and has a, gives a history and you do a physical exam. Uh, you have, through your diagnostic reasoning process, uh, have a working diagnosis. Uh, also think about what testing might be effective to uh, and pin, uh, pin down the diagnosis. And then we use decision analysis to decide on the best therapy. We also rely heavily, obviously, on the best evidence. The best evidence informs our diagnostic reasoning and it informs our clinical decision analysis. Now, there are some forces that try and often do undermine, undermine our diagnostic reasoning and clinical decision analysis. And those are cognitive errors we're going to spend a fair amount of time in the fourth year uh, going over uh, and looking into cognitive errors. Uh, and we also have conflicts of interest, you know, where we're, student, we're doing what's best for us, perhaps, and not the patient. These two forces will interfere with sound reasoning. Now, what are the key skills, then, of clinical reasoning? And we have a clinical reasoning thread that extends through the four years, started last year in your foundations course uh, with Dr. Gouda. The major elements are, of course, diagnostic reasoning, uh, where you generate and refine a differential diagnosis. There's effective testing, where you use the sensitivity and specificity of tests and come up with an accurate interpretation of diagnostic tests, order the tests that will be useful and don't order the tests that won't be useful. And there's clinical decision analysis where you explore um, the different options with the patient and come up with an effective and appropriate plan for that patient. There's also best evidence. This is obvious. We stress this throughout your four years. Uh, there are good resources to locate the most reliable and useful evidence. And that's a, an element of the thread that we visit over and over again. Then, as mentioned, there are cognitive biases. These are thought processes that undermine rational thinking, and often they operate unconsciously, and as mentioned, we're going to explore them more in the fourth year. And lastly, as also mentioned, we, there are conflicts of interest, uh, and we need to be aware of, of the conflicts that we face or experience and try to uh, make sure that we're serving the patient. We'll also visit that later in mechanisms and practice in the fall. So we're going to focus in this mechanisms and practice session uh, on three of the six elements. We're going to go into diagnostic reasoning. Uh, we'll talk about how to generate and refine a differential diagnosis. And then the preceptors are going to spend a couple minutes on uh, the cognitive biases that, that influence or undermine diagnostic reasoning. We're also going to look at clinical decision analysis. How do we go about, with so much uncertainty in outcomes, how do we go about and settle on an effective and appropriate plan for the patient? And lastly, we will have a session where we look at the best evidence, the best resources to locate the most reliable and useful evidence. So let's start with diagnostic reasoning. Uh, most of us uh, grew up um, before data mining with the hypothetical deductive reasoning model. That is, you have a hypothesis, and then you deduce that uh, something will be true, and you'll explore that. For example, a patient comes in with edema, and you 
Through induction, you come up with a list of causes of edema, heart failure, cirrhosis, nephrotic syndrome. And then you make a deduction. If it's heart failure, the ejection fraction should be low. Um, if it's cirrhosis or nephrotic syndrome, the albumin should be low. You measure those, you find that the ejection fraction is normal and albumin is low. That rules out CHF, uh, leaving you with cirrhosis and nephrotic syndrome. Uh, now you deduce that there'll be albumin in the ur urine if it's present or not. If it is present, it's probably nephrotic syndrome. And through this series of deductions uh, and hypothesis generation, you come up with the uh, correct diagnosis, nephrotic syndrome. So this is a slow process. It's a lot of cognitive load. You have to sit and think, uh, make assumptions, um, make uh, some deductions. Uh, but obviously, this is, this is what we would call slow thinking. But there's another way to get to a diagnosis, and that's through pattern recognition. What if somebody comes into the emergency room complaining of edema, and you find right then and there that there's a low albumin and there's proteinuria? That is recognizable as the pattern of nephrotic syndrome. And the more seasoned you get, the more often you'll use pattern recognition to come up with a diagnosis. Now, there are you know, pitfalls using either one of those methods, and probably the best, best clinicians use a little of both processes. So we call that dual processing, and your preceptor is going to go over this with you. Uh, we have the slow process where we generate a hypothesis, uh, as just mentioned, uh, with all those clues, and you, you narrow down the possibilities by your subsequent test. Um, but then there's the much faster uh, system two, excuse me, system one thinking, where the pattern is recognized and the patient uh, is diagnosed with a recognizable syndrome with a given pattern. Machines are good at this too, by the way. As I mentioned, there are cognitive biases that affect our diagnostic reasoning. They kind of lurk in the background, off, usually unconscious, and they will, they will influence our diagnostic process and uh, often throw us off track. Um, one example uh, is availability. Uh, you judge a condition because it occurred as occurring more frequently or less frequently based on how readily you think of the diagnosis. So, for example, you go to lupus clinic, see a patient with lupus, many patients, uh, then you go back to your own clinic, and an, an older woman who clonked her knee on the dishwasher um, complains uh, to you, and you the first thing you think of is lupus, uh, because you just saw a conference on lupus, and it's, it's available, it's right in the back of your mind. Uh, and the likelihood, of course, of it being lupus is far less likely than it would be osteoarthritis or traumatic uh, joint injury from clocking into the dishwasher. Another example is anchoring. Uh, the sequence by which uh, the patient tells you their story often uh, fixes uh, an early part of the story in your mind. For example, the patient uh, comes in complaining of stomach pain and holding their stomach, and you're exploring that, and then the patient actually realizes that it's really not the stomach pain, it's sort of the back that's getting referred to the stomach and they're actually, they're trying to tell you that it's your back pain, but you're just focused and anchored on the uh, uh, abdominal GI pain. And it's very hard to change gears. Um, that's been shown in many studies. And lastly, what we call diagnosis momentum. You know, the patient comes in, uh, has a diagnosis, uh, you receive the patient, you accept the diagnosis, and you really don't think about it much. It's the classic example is the emergency room diagnosis. Patient is admitted to the floor uh, with a diagnosis. The patient comes to the floor, you see the patient, and you kind of assume that that's what the diagnosis is, uh, and when in fact uh, maybe it isn't. Uh, often it's the case that it's not because the emergency room, through no fault of their own, it's very hard making diagnoses in the emergency room, when you've just seen the patient once, uh, but it means that you really have to think about the diagnosis that was sent up and avoid diagnosis momentum. So the learning objectives for the diagnostic reasoning session uh, are, are threefold uh, to describe the two diagnostic strategies. We talked about pattern recognition, uh, the uh, fast, and the hypothesis generation slow. Um, you're going to work on prior prioritizing the diagnoses. 
uh, based on probabilities of various diagnoses, and then be aware of some of the cognitive biases. I mentioned three of them here. There are actually many more that are really interesting, and again, we'll talk about it in the fourth year. Now let's move on to clinical decision analysis. In this day and age, the patients are confronted with a very difficult decision sometimes where uh, there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, who knows you know, how effective this treatment or that treatment is going to be, and which should I choose? Uh, so we use decision analysis, and it's a way to visualize, literally visualize, and weigh the pros and cons. So we'd all, in making a decision, we'd say, well, what are the pros and cons? Patients must know what the major pros and cons are. You know, I'm sure you've heard a family member, maybe even yourself, uh, hear the words, you know, the doctor never told me that was going to happen. So we're not great at talking about the major pros and cons of any intervention. You don't have to consider all the pros and cons. Some of them are trivial. So first and foremost, what are the pros and cons? Now, the second issue is that there are probabilities involved. Some pros or cons are more likely than other pros or cons. There's a probability associated with each pro and con. So if you choose uh, an operation and one of the cons is that there might be some complication, uh, through the anesthesia, it's important to know what the probabilities are. And the third point is that patients feel very differently about the pros and cons. Some cons to one patient might be pros to another, and vice versa. And really, uh, one has to pay homage to the fact that it's only the patient, only the individual patient knows what an outcome means to them. Lastly, can the pros and cons be visualized. And we are going to go through some decision trees that can represent the options, the pros and cons, their probabilities, and what they mean to a patient. It's actually a very effective tool, uh, as you'll see in a second, and um, you can use it as a point of focus with your patients. So let's look at briefly at the, you know, a case of a cerebral aneurysm. Uh, any decision, you know, clip or not is associated with uncertainty. There are chance outcomes. The surgery might go well, but there's a chance that the patient will develop a post-op stroke. Or the wait, mindful waiting and no surgery uh, might be go well for several years, but there's a chance that the patient is going to have a rupture. Each chance outcome is associated with a probability. What is, what is the probability that a patient with the clipping will develop a stroke? That's in the literature. But people, you know, that's been studied. And it's only the patient, just to reiterate how important this is, that knows how a chance outcome will affect their lives. If the stroke is debilitating, maybe the patient would not want to survive the stroke. So these are all um, the questions that one thinks about when constructing a decision tree. And let's look at a decision tree. So for the cerebral aneurysm, we have a decision node, it's called, and we have two possible choices here. Now, there, in some cases, there are more choices. You know, for cancer therapy, there's often radiation, or there's uh, chemotherapy, or there's no therapy, or immunotherapy. So in this case, we've simplified it and said there are only two options. With each option, there are going to be chance events. Um, you know, with no surgery, and one of the outcomes might be no rupture. The patient lives happily ever after, and there's no rupture. But the other possibility is that there'll be rupture and death. The same uh, is true of surgery. There are outcomes, chance outcomes. Uh, for example, the repair could be successful um, and everything uh, turns out well, or the patient actually has a stroke as a result of the surgery. And I just mentioned that the, this tree is simplified uh, because I've only put in two chance outcomes, uh, but obviously as things become more complicated, there'll be more chance outcomes. And as perhaps you heard me speak uh, a couple of years ago in my lecture on artificial intelligence, a machine is going to help us uh, analyze these decision trees. Now, for each chance outcome, there's a probability. Actually, the neurologists and neurosurgeons have really good data on the probability of rupture given a size of the aneurysm or the probability of a stroke during a repair. And with each, so we have two things now. We have the we need to think of what the chance outcomes are, and we need to think about the probabilities. 
and then we think about what the patient thinks about that outcome. For example, no rupture, patient might, one, might say, that's perfect. I'm, f- I'm never going to think about it again. I'm just, I'm not going to get operated on and I just, it will be out of my mind. The other patient might say, I'm going to worry about the rupture every single day. I'm going to worry about it at night. My husband's going to worry about it you know, when he's sleeping in bed with me. He's afraid I'm going to rupture. I have a headache uh, and I'm going to worry about that. And it, so these two patients have a completely different take on what that outcome is. Now with rupture and death, patient one might say, well, that's absolutely terrible. Uh, and maybe they both think that's terrible. You know, dying after rupture is a, is a terrible outcome for a patient, needless to say. If we look at surgery, a successful repair, patient one may say, well, it's almost perfect uh, because, you know, they're worried about a stroke. Uh, and patient may too, too may say, this is, this is the perfect outcome for me. I'm not going to sit around and wait. I have to do something. I'm going to have a, a surgery and, and the repair is successful. That's perfect. But what if... They have a stroke. So patient one may say that's not acceptable. I do not want to be alive if I have a stroke. This is, um, there's a subgroup of patients that basically do not want to be alive uh, after a stroke. Well, their families might want them to be alive, but the patient doesn't. Patient number two might say, well, look, I tried. I'm a more, you know, I'm an aggressive person. Uh, it was what I, at least I tried, and, and, and then I unfortunately had a stroke. So the point of this discussion is to be mindful that patients have different views about the same outcome. And that's one of the things that we're going to discuss in the workshop. The benefits of decision analysis is a, it's a framework to ma- manage the uncertainty. As I mentioned, that you know, there are good probabilities for a cerebral aneurysm, but in some cases the probabilities are kind of vague or there's a range of probabilities. So there's, there's much uncertainty. And, and of course, it's uncertain if you're going to have a stroke or, or, or perfect surgery. So the benefit of using this approach, in my mind, it, first of all, it provides a checklist. You think about the options, you think about the downstream chance outcomes and their estimated probability. It's a structured way to make sure you're thinking about all the different possibilities of outcomes and then think about how, how probable they are. It also reinforces shared decision-making. In considering the impact of each outcome, we focus on the patient's assessment. The patient may say to you, you know, if it was you, what would you do? Uh, What they're really saying is, what do you think I should do? And the only way that can be answered is to know what the patient thinks about each outcome. Uh, The patients will have very, and we'll see this in the conference, they have very different views of what a particular outcome is or how that affects them. And lastly, uh, but of course, most importantly, uh, the uh, decision analysis reinforces best evidence-based practice. In other words, to answer those questions as to what the probabilities are, what are even the outcomes from a particular intervention, it requires consulting in the literature to inform the analysis. So there are, I think, three major reasons to engage in decision analysis. So what are the learning objectives for the session on decision analysis? First and foremost, uh, it's to identify the major potential outcomes of a decision. You really have to rack your brain sometimes to think about what might happen, again, major one, major outcomes, what might happen if the patient undergoes this treatment or that treatment. Um, Secondly, to generate a decision tree that links the decision to the potential outcomes and the likelihood of those outcomes. You know, some outcomes are far more likely than others. We will discuss the ways that a medical outcome can be valued by the patient. There are different, you know, mechanisms for this or the different strategies. Uh, But most importantly, we discuss how the same outcome means different things to different patients. And you'll see that during our session, that one student will think one thing about an outcome and another student will think just the opposite. Let's move on to best evidence. Uh, We have discussed many times that the key factor in good medical practice is finding the best evidence. That's not always easy, and sometimes the best evidence isn't even available because it hasn't been discovered yet. Um, But we do the best we can using search strategies. So just focusing a bit on the 
students, uh, you who are in the major clinical year, and, and we went through this in my lecture last year uh, on um, the best resources, is the first and foremost, absolutely the first thing you do when you're working up a patient or thinking about it is to ask yourself, what do I need to know? Uh, it may be that you've dealt with this patient's condition countless times, and so what you need to know is very different from if this is the first time you've seen a patient with, with that particular illness. So the first information need might be, does my patient have uh, this disease? I pick chronic kidney disease because, as you know, I'm a kidney doctor. Um, does the patient have CKD? So you need to review in what are the attributes of a patient with chronic kidney disease. Uh, then you want to know what the causes are. Of uh, Remind yourself, I know you learned this uh, last year, but uh, it's good to remind yourself of what the causes are. You probably need a refresher. Um, and then thinking about the treatment, uh, what are the guidelines for treating the patients with chronic kidney disease? Uh, there are some optimal treatments, uh, but that require some choice. Uh, ACE inhibitor, a calcium channel blocker, or, you know, what, what is the state of the art for the optimal treatment? And what's the con of giving someone those therapies? So maybe you want to know what the adverse events are of the optimal treatment. And I think, in a way, most importantly, your patient is going to want to know what the prognosis is. Whether They're going to want to know if they need to be on dialysis soon, they're going to have to go on dialysis, and you'll want to know something about the prognosis and natural history and, and maybe look at some probability curves or probability um, calculations. Then during your year, your clerkship year, you're also going to be asked to give presentations. And uh, if you're going to give a 10-minute talk on chronic kidney disease, you're going to need several um several pieces of information, overview, you'll probably drill down on some aspect of it, but it's, but the evidence required is actually a little bit different from what you would if you were taking care of a patient. You might not need to focus on the adverse events. You're going to drill down. And the scholarly project uh, is also far more uh, granular, if you will. Um, let's say a scholarly project looks at um, retarding the progression of CKD. Where do you start? Uh, and where you start on this is going to actually be uh, very different from if you're getting a general overview of the chronic kidney disease. Um, before we go to the evidence pyramid, which I'm all hoping you remember from last year, we'll talk a little bit about focus and context. There clearly, and, and the literature likes to divide up information needs into two big buckets. There's background, general questions. What's the etiology, natural history, management prognosis of the generic pro patient with a condition, let's say chronic kidney disease. So generally that's in textbooks. It gives you an overview of what, what does a CKD patient suffer or expect or experience on average. Uh, but it doesn't say anything specific related to their disease or comorbidity. And so there is a different level, if you will, of information needs, which is what we refer to as foreground. It's this patient, not any patient. It's this specific patient who has a specific cause of the condition, perhaps it's some kind of, um, you know, glomerulonephritis. And it also looks at the um, context. The patient might have comorbidities. It might be taking medications. Um, and there may be social issues. It's really focusing on the individual. So a patient comes to you as a clinical clerk on the wards, uh, the first thing you want to know is some background. What is this condition generally? And then ask, where, what, what do I want to know about this particular patient who has very specific uh, context or very specific uh, constellation of, of uh, comorbidities in medicines, etc. So where do you go? for foreground and background information. Uh, first, I remind you of the evidence pyramid. Um, at the very top are computerized decision support systems, which are state-of-the-art, generally guidelines to manage you know, one disease or another. They're not widely distributed now, but they will be during your, your, your practice, probably during your training. 
Uh, then there are the textbooks um, that are evidence-based clinical practice guidelines and textbooks like Access Medicine, Up to Date. And if you want a general background uh, on a particular disease, your best bet is to go to the textbooks. Uh, do not go to PubMed. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, and in the textbook, you'll get a nice overview of the uh, generic uh, aspects of a disease. Uh, now, below that, uh, and it's a pyramid because there's uh, there, there are less information in the textbooks compared to PubMed at the bottom, that it's literally uh, showing the volume of information. So underneath the textbooks, we have systematic reviews, and the best out there are Cochrane, uh, Dynamed, PubMed reviews. This is where um, maybe there's a little bit of debate as to whether treatment one or treatment two is preferred. Cochrane has uh, wonderful uh, studies where they actually will analyze whether or not that's question be an that question has been answered. They've, they've taken sometimes hundreds of studies and then synthesized them into a review. Uh, it's unbiased. They're not uh, receiving money from any drug company. Uh, the only problem is that uh, sometimes the question you have in mind, you know, is drug one better than drug two for this patient with chronic kidney disease, that particular question may never have been answered by a systematic review. And that puts you in the awkward position, puts all of us in the awkward position, of going to the original literatures in PubMed. Now, PubMed uh, has the um, appearance of being, you know, believable, all the articles, but in fact, um, many of the studies in PubMed have not been reproduced, uh, or in some cases, they're fake, you know, it's fake news, because a drug company has paid somebody to write an article. Uh, it's the least reliable evidence compared to the textbooks and vetted by the experts, um, and it's reliable, it's believable, and they often have the key references from PubMed studies that you can look up that support uh, the conclusions. Uh, when you go to PubMed, uh, you can easily get lost in a black hole and find the wrong articles. Now, that said, what do you do when you're researching your scholarly project? And, of course, you can start out on general terms, but you do have to go to PubMed because you cannot reinvent the wheel for your scholarly project. And so you need to read the literature yourself, basically, and find all the articles on the topic to make sure that to see where the state of the art is. Has the question that you seek to answer already been answered, or it hasn't, and you've got a great project in mind, and there's really nothing written on it, but there are just a couple articles, uh, and that's where you uh, really uh, go to PubMed and do a major search. It's not easy researching a topic and doing due diligence. Every time I write a paper, uh, I always do due diligence before I start the project, and then when I'm writing the paper, I do it again, and I, every now and then I notice an article I didn't see the first time around, which is obviously horrifying if, if it ends up um, re reporting what you've just spent six months studying, but most of the time that isn't the case. So here's our evidence pyramid, and for foreground questions, as uh, you start in the textbooks, because there may be a very specific part uh, paragraph in up to date, which deals exactly with the, that particular patient that you're caring for, with a, answering a foreground question, um, or if not, you can go to a Cochrane review to see if it's there or Dynamed, and if not, you may have to go to um, PubMed uh, to uh, see if there's any more information on uh, uh, answering your question. So the learning objectives uh, for the best evidence section are going to be simple. Uh, just talk about information needs, focus and context, background and foreground. There's a very useful um, concepts because I think you can sit there when you're thinking about what you don't know and ask yourself, well, hold on, is, you know, is this background? Uh, maybe I need a little background. I forgot what they taught me last year. Um, or maybe I know a lot about this condition because I've thought about it a lot and I really need to answer a very explicit question on my patient who's in the hospital. Um, I'd also encourage you to think about the hierarchy of resources and think about the evidence pyramid when you go look for information to answer your question. Um, our conference leaders uh, on Tuesday uh, are going to be uh, Nancy Chang and Kathy Nickerson, um, 
Nancy runs the primary care clerkship. Kathy Nickerson runs the medicine clerkship. They're going to talk about diagnostic reasoning. Ben Kummer and me, uh, we're going to talk about clinical decision analysis. Ben is a neurologist who is doing a clinical informatics fellowship. And lastly, uh, Anna Getzelman, who's the head of the library, and John Useglio, who is one of the librarians and informationists, are going to talk about best evidence. That concludes my remarks on clinical reasoning thread, and I'm looking forward to seeing you on Tuesday.